Hello, I'm Jane Wenham-Jones and I am going to be talking to the wonderful multi-award winning Claire McIntosh. Today, Claire should have been in Broadstairs, at Broadstairs Lit. There's the poster, she should have been here. But because of this damn virus, um, I'm going to speak to her on Zoom instead. So, let me just tell you a little bit about Claire, for those of you who don't already know. Her first novel, I Let You Go, was the fastest selling new title by a crime writer in 2015. It was followed by I See You and Let Me Lie. All three were Sunday Times number one bestsellers and Richard and Judy Picks. Since then, those books have sold over two million copies worldwide. And her latest work, After the End, spent seven weeks in the Sunday Times bestseller list for hardback, and it came out in paperback on the 28th of May. We're recording this while we were both in lockdown and had all the time, um, but I'm quite sure that since then it has stormed up the charts. Hello, Claire. Hello, I can't help but feel you've jinxed it for me now. <laughs> I'm sure I haven't. I'm sure I haven't. Um, but anyway, it's going to be, I mean, it did so well in hardback. It was that book, After the End, is a little bit of a departure, isn't it, from the other three? Because the first three were very much known for their amazing twists and were, what would you call the first three? Psychological thrillers, crime thrillers? Yeah, psychological thrillers. And After the End is just as suspenseful, um, but it, it is not a thriller. Okay, yeah. And it is um, it is suspenseful. It's a family story. You, you tell us a little bit about it, because obviously we don't want any spoilers, but um, so it's After the very End is compelling. about a couple uh, Max and Pip, who have a, a three-year-old son, Dylan, and Dylan's very, very sick. He's in the paediatric intensive care unit uh, of a hospital in Birmingham. And they have to make an impossible decision about his, his future, whether to continue to fight to treat him, um, even though that treatment is still going to leave him with incredibly profound um, disabilities that will affect his quality of life or whether they should turn off his life support machine. And the parents disagree. And so After the End is a book about how those two people come to terms with their choices and what it does to them as a couple. And you, I mean, it's a very moving book. It's a very thought provoking book, but you didn't just do it as a linear story, did you? It's got quite an interesting structure. It has. Well, so I've always been fascinated by uh, a particular poem, um, one of my favourite poems um, by Robert Frost, which is called The Road Not Taken. And um, this, uh, and I really by now I should be able to quote the whole poem verbatim, and I still can't I have a terrible memory for things like that. <laughs> it was on but Radio 4 about, just the other morning. Oh, really? Yes. He talks about standing in um, a yellow wood and looking down two different paths and trying to decide which one to take. And he says something like, would that I could be one traveller and, and travel both. Um, because we, we all do that. We all get to these crossroads, these forks in, in life, and we want to know what's going to happen if we take that path versus that path. Um, and so that poem formed the, the catalyst for the structure of the novel because in After the End, we get to travel two different paths. We get to follow the future as it would play out if Max, the dad, got his way and, and was able to take his son to America for pioneering treatment. But we also follow the future as it would play out if Dylan's mother, Pip, uh, was granted her choice at court and was allowed to let her son pass away. Um, and it's a, a story, I suppose, of, of what ifs, um, which is something that I, I think we can all relate to. Uh, most of us, hopefully, haven't had to make those life changing decisions, but we've all had difficult choices to make and decisions that impact on the rest of our lives. And of course, it is a very personal book to you, isn't it? It is, yes. It's, it, it's personal to me because it's 
uh, it's the choice that, that I had to make about my own son. So 13 years ago, when um, my son was very small, he was five weeks old, um, he was critically ill and my husband and I had to make this decision that Max and Pip make about their fictional son. And I remember asking the doctor at the time, what happens if my husband and I don't agree? Because like most couples, we disagreed on all sorts of things, you know, over what we were going to have for tea and what colour to paint the, the bedroom. And, and, and they never matter, those decisions, however big they feel at the time. But here was something that mattered more than anything else in the world and about which there was absolutely no compromise. And she said, you have to agree because the alternative is unthinkable. And what I wanted to write with after the end was the unthinkable. Mm. And how, do, how was it to write that? Both the easiest story to write and the hardest. Um, it, it wrote itself to, to a certain extent. It, it's very much a character driven book. Um, which is probably the biggest contrast to my thrillers, which are very plot driven uh, with after the end, once I knew who Max and Pip were, then I, I just had to let the story unfold because really it, it's that the narrative is about what do these people do? You know, what's their decision? Why? And, and, and how does it uh, impact on the rest of their lives? So, so from that point of view, it was, it was very straightforward. What was difficult was that it was a very emotional book to write. It's a very emotional story, even without the personal element. Um, and I had to access some of the emotions that I have intentionally locked away for more than a decade. Um, I, I was a police officer for many years, as you know, and I think police officers, probably like many other emergency services workers, perhaps like teachers, social workers, we learn to lock our feelings away. We learn to compartmentalize because it's a, a much easier way of coping with some of the horrific things that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis at work. And I think that, that skill at compartmentalizing and uh, shutting myself off from what I was, was feeling it extended to the rest of my life and so after my son died I I just didn't let myself think about some of the some of the some of the emotions I didn't let myself grieve so when I came to write after the end in order to make it a, a truly authentic book uh, a, in order to capture the the raw emotion that Max and Pip would be feeling had to go into those feelings and um, and explore them and write them and obviously that was very very painful but it was also an incredibly cathartic thing to do mm. a healing thing perhaps yeah absolutely absolutely I mean I, I think people always talk about how writing is is very therapeutic and I've always found that I started writing really as a, a form of processing my my emotions and um, I started writing very, very soon after my, my son died, in fact. So the, the two things for me, writing and grieving, are very, very interlinked. Well, you have um, three wonderful, healthy children today, don't you? And um, you're currently, as we speak, down in lockdown. How is that going with them? Are you homeschooling? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so if you'd have asked me on... Friday I would have told you it was going really well um, it's now Monday and it, it well we're talking it's 20 past four so the school day has finished um, I just don't think I've achieved anything today I mean uh -huh. really anything I um, I had grand plans of what we were going to do in school and how I was going to fit my work around that I got my edit notes back um, early this morning for uh, my fifth novel and so I was going to order those and get my head around how to to tackle them and ready to start tomorrow clear my inbox lots and lots of administrative things to do lots of videos to, to film today um, and I've just I've done none of those um, 
maths was just a, a complete disaster. Um, my husband was going to take maths today and then he, he got caught up with something else. He's a mountain rescue volunteer. So he was busy doing um, a call out. Um, and I do not understand ratios, it turns <laughs> out. I thought I did um, until I started trying to explain them to my children and it seems I don't. So that was a bust. Um, you know, thank heavens for BBC Bite Size really is, is all I can say. <laughs> I was going to ask you about your fifth novel. Is your fifth novel um, similar in genre to After the End or have you gone back to the psychological thriller? Uh, you see, I, I really struggle with this sort of question about genre and the, the kind of, the, the idea that I go back to a genre or I just, I just write the stories you know and okay. and over the course of writing them it becomes clear what what shelf they might fit on but uh, I mean I Let You Go which was my my debut novel and uh, uh, a psychological thriller has at its heart a, a love story um, an emotional uh, women-led issue story there's so much going on in that novel um, I See You is probably the most traditional psychological thriller that, that I've written. Um, the other two are, are quite sort of family drama oriented. Um, book five is a thriller. Right. Definitely a thriller, uh, but again, with quite a lot of emotion, quite a lot of heart, um, a real focus on the relationship between mother and child and father and child um, and the story is told from both the perspective of, of the mother and the father again so from that point of view it's it's uh, very similar to after the end it is set on the first ever non-stop flight from london to sydney so it's a 20-hour oh. locked room thriller um kind of uh, orient express in the air mile high <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard it here first. Um, it's funny recording on Zoom because I want to look at you, but then of course I'm probably not looking into the camera. And at the end, you're oh, looking know, all wonderful, and I'll be looking look very down there. I, I'm looking at you um, on the basis that it's just too weird to look at nothing. So I know I'm looking at you. Too. People watching at home, if I'm looking shifty, that's why. <laughs> Well, I'm going to try and look into the camera to say that do get hold of Claire's books if you haven't read them already. If you have read them already, read them again because we will be getting Claire down to Broadstairs Lit. And I know you'll have lots of questions to ask her yourself and it'll be a chance of, to get a signed copy. So as soon as we can, we will reschedule. But I hope you've enjoyed us chatting to each other. And Claire, we really, really look forward to seeing you in Broadstairs by the Sea. I very, cannot very wait to. Love Thank you. Thank you.